Good evening, everyone. As Pro Vice Chancellor for Education and Student Experience at the University of Bedfordshire, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to a very exciting evening with public lecture tonight. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, we've had to go all online, but we're delighted that we've been able to do so and that we won't miss out this chance to hear the inspirational, thought-provoking insight. So welcome, everyone. It's an honour to welcome this evening's guest speaker back to the University of Bedfordshire. The University of Bedfordshire first met Lisa Wainwright, MBE, in July 2019, when she was awarded an honorary doctorate of science by the University of Bedfordshire in recognition of her services to sport education, which is a very well-deserved honor that marks her fantastic career in the sports industry. And we're very grateful that Lisa's found the time in her extremely busy schedule to join us online this evening to deliver this in the event titled Pride in Yourself and Proud of Others. So this chat, will deliver this month's, marking the Pride Month, will explore Lisa's outstanding career in the field of sport and her leadership and tireless work to give that platform to other members of the LGBT plus community. So for those of you who may not be aware, Lisa is the Chief Executive of the Sport and Recreation Alliance, and she spent years in the sports industry in very senior roles for Sport England, England Netball and Volleyball England. But before all this, Lisa trained as a physical education teacher. She was at the University of Warwick and then went on to do a master's in learning and teaching. So alongside her busy work schedule, Lisa undertakes voluntary work in Africa and is the director of the Wallace Group of Universities, supporting team sports and in particular women and girls in Namibia and in Zambia. So 2019 was quite the year for Lisa. She was ranked eight in the top 100 executive LGBT plus allies by the Financial Times and became an ambassador for Women on Boards UK. And she was also named the Women CEO of the Year. And of course, as previously mentioned, the same year she was awarded her honorary doctorate of science uh, for her services to sport education by the university. So Lisa's fantastic and groundbreaking career was recognized once again in 2021, where she was awarded the MBE for her services to sport in the Queen's Birthday Honours list, which is a very well-deserved achievement, which I'm sure you all recognize and agree. At the University of Bedfordshire, we are passionate about supporting our students and our staff LGBT plus community. And the sentiment of this, which Lisa shares, and a large part of her work is the dedication, campaigning to see other out LGBT plus figures in the senior roles within the sport industry. So her motivations are simple, and that's to enable people to better themselves. She credits a host of mentors and coaches throughout her career, for both guiding, supporting, challenging and motivating her. So as we go through and have the chat, Lisa will be happy to take questions and we encourage you to make use of the comments function online so on your screen to submit those questions. So without further ado, I would like to take the opportunity uh, to hear from an incredibly inspiring figure from the sports industry. Uh, so ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends and colleagues, Please welcome Lisa Wainwright, MBE. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. It's an absolute honour to be here at the University of Bedfordshire and a real privilege to, to speak to some of your students and staff and some of your local community. Good evening to you all. Thank you. So just to start off, can you talk us through your, your current role in the sport and recreation sector and what that is like in a sort of day to day? Yeah, sure. So as you said, so I'm the chief exec of something called the Sport and Recreation Alliance. And for any of your students that might be studying sport, that's the old CCPR, the Central Council of Physical Recreation, founded by Prince Philip. Uh, God bless him. Um, and what are we? We're a membership body of over 300 organisations 
um, that provide an independent voice back to government. So if I did an, an A to Z of sports, it would go from athletics and basketball and canoeing all the way along to Zumba with caravan and camping movement and dance in between. So all the different types of sports and recreation are our members. And our role is really to represent them, as I say, to government to provide support to them. And we believe that you know everybody should be able to take part in sport and it should be a positive experience for them. So that's what we do. Uh, we're based down in, in London, in High Holborn, although we work hybrid. And we have a team of about 20 to 22 staff, depending on, on times a year. And a lot of our work is, as I say, working with government. So often we support government. So during COVID, there was a huge amount of work working with the Department for Culture, Media and Sport in approving the guidance that each sport had to provide prior to opening up to ensure they were safe. We also work with government on policy areas like the online harms bill that you might have heard about and the impact on sport and sports participants as well. Um, we're currently working on the Gambling Act, so you'll know concerns around particularly shirt sponsorship and gambling. So we work in a lot of policy areas um, and we also work in terms of our, our members in specific technical areas that they might need, for example, in um, GDPR world when, when that first came out and others. And a lot of our work is helping national governing bodies with their board, with good governance, with reviews and providing support across the sector for leadership and management, particularly for individuals in the sector. So that's what we do day to day. I could be in Parliament in Westminster, as I, I was due to be last night. I could be down at Henley um, advising one of the CEOs or, or working with one of the boards. Um, or I could be back at a local sports club, grassroots club, um, looking at what it means from a sustainability point of view. And our strategy is, is literally around four key elements is, is really championing the, the economic and, and social um, well-being of, of sport as a sector. Two, protecting and promoting our members and our members' interests. Three is around equality, diversity, inclusion that we're talking about today. And four is around sustainability for the sector for the future. So, so that's what we do. It's a huge privilege to do this job. And um, I have a great team that I love working with. So how do you get your voice to be heard in Parliament when <laughs> with sport and physical activity that we know is not always at the top of everybody's agendas? It's, it's extremely challenging. Um, and we have um, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport with Nigel Hudson, our current um, sports minister, is incredibly positive. But the challenge of a very small department compared to, for example, the Home Office, when you look at reducing crime by uh, physical activity and such, when you look at the Department of Health and preventative measures, it's really challenging trying to work across government. So some of the things we've been doing is setting up a, a national sector partner group. So all the elements of sport, whether that be public leisure, whether it's sports governing bodies, the workforce through SIMSPA, we brought them all together to have one voice back to government. And we're currently influencing the government strategy across government rather than just in our own department. It's not easy, um, but we continue to, to drive forward for the sector because we know it's the right thing to do from a preventative perspective. Yeah. So it's effectively trying to make it meaningful across what they're doing as well and the importance of sport within those areas. Yeah, if we invest in, in sport and physical recreation, we'll be happier, we'll be healthier. We won't be a burden on the NHS. There'll be less people coming through. There'll be, there'll be a much stronger economic gain for every one pound invested in sport, for example. There's a four pound return. So it's a big treasury argument. Um, but most people just see sport as the sport that you see on TV. They don't necessarily understand the, the size of the sector and the numbers involved. Mm -hmm. So from your CV then, I see you were the sports sabbatical officer or SAB, sports <laughs> SAB, they used to call it, at the University of Warwick. So how was that for you and any advice for any um, other students or more generally? Yeah, I mean, I had a fabulous, I mean, I hope your students have and everybody who's, who's come through university, I had a fabulous time at Warwick. Um, I did four years, I did a BA uh, with qualified teacher status uh, in physical education and then decided to stand for election as, as you crazily do. Um, but when I got to university, this is my coming out story, because you all, if you've come out, will have a story. Um, it's not a coming out story. Literally, my, my dad found me kissing my girlfriend at age 17. So he found out fairly quickly. Um, and at the time, it was really challenging, really difficult. But now reflecting back, it not having to make the decision to come out, which is a massive decision. I was quite fortunate. And, and luckily, when I got to university, therefore, <clears throat> I was already out. My parents knew wasn't overly impressed my dad but my mum understood that's that's the way I was 
and, and, and gradually they came round. So anyway, I got to university. I was I was out. And I realised a lot of people weren't out at university, even though it was clear to me that that they were gay, that they just didn't want to be out. So I, I went to this gay sock thing, a gay society, they're probably called LGBTQI societies now and, and, and all the rest of it. But it was a gay society. I was petrified, you know, I was absolutely petrified, even though I was out that somebody might see me going to this this, this society. Anyway, I went and, and met lots of, of, of friends in that. But I had a very active life. I'd, I was intramural rep. Uh, university and netball captain and one of the the really big affirmations I got although I was out I still wasn't I wasn't really sure what that meant um and I remember bizarrely Tom Robinson who some people on on who are listening may know he sang glad to be gay many many years ago he was mm. at our freshers fair and I was stood in this auditorium of about 2,000 drunk students me included and this bloke started singing Glad to be Gay. And it was like this kind of thing shooting down from heaven saying it's OK. It was really odd. Um, couldn't have been planned any better. Anyway, mm -hmm. so that was kind of my welcoming in my first year at university. And I thought it's going to be OK. Um, but as I stood for election, I started to worry because I decided I'd go public, as in, please elect me. These are my views. And I thought, oh, what if people don't like me because I'm gay? because she's so absorbed in, in in being gay at that point. It's a bit like if any of anyone who watched Heartstopper recently or read the books, it's all about being gay at that age. You can't think of anything else. It, it's just that it's just so important. So I was really worried about standing for election. And, and the thing that changed was the men's rugby captain came up to me, massive guy, and he just said, Lise, the team are behind you. What do you want us to do? And it just it just meant so much. He believed in me, not because of my sexuality, he just believed in me. And it didn't yeah. matter if I happened to be a lesbian. So I said to him, well, I'm going to sing Let, Let's Get Physical. Do you mind Do you mind putting on Lyca and dancing behind me? Because you had to do a joker speech and, and, and sing a song. And, and I swear not, the rugby team dressed in Lycra danced behind me. And whether that won with the election or not, I told them that it did. And, and then I became sabbatical and didn't really look back since. And and I guess what was really important at that point that because I was out, that seemed to give people confidence to come out as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's my key experience, I guess, for people listening is for me, it was positive. For many others, it's not. But for me, it was positive and it, it reinforced me being myself and I'm proud of myself. And I think to anybody listening, just be proud of yourself because you're unique. You are you. And there's nobody more you than you. It's a Dr. Zeus quote, but it's really important if if you, you know, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, bisexual, trans, be proud of being you. And that's what university meant to me, and particularly being a sabbatical. Mm. And do you think the experience of being at university made any of that easier? With because in, in non-university life, you wouldn't have that society set up. Um, you know, so some of the structures, and maybe just university students are known for just you know being able to be free hopefully they feel that i completely i come from a little tiny yorkshire mining town and i think you know the shock to my dad i don't think he knew what the word meant lesbian he'd, he'd never seen one or heard of one it it was a real issue and and i knew i had to get out of that town to be me and and i think mum knew that in the background and luckily through sport i i managed to to get through um, so no, I think I was very fortunate in, in the university I went to, they had a gay society a lot, didn't at that time, it's a few years back now, and they went to Pride, in my first year I got to go to London Pride, which was a whole new world at that stage, um, so yeah, I think I think my life would have been very different had I not had that positive experience of university and been supported throughout it. Yeah, yeah. So you've come a long way since that early start as a sabbatical officer, you know, so what were some of the key experiences you've had and how they've developed really, you've developed from there that's potentially you've helped to, to the sort of future that you took, the career path that you took? Yeah, so I was, I was really lucky. I, um, I didn't go into teaching in the end. Somebody came to me in my office of sabbatical and said, I found the perfect job for you, Lisa. It's called the development officer in netball. And I was netball captain and a mad netballer. So I moved into sports development, which was very early on in the in the uh, sector as a sports development sector. Um, and I, I really enjoyed my time at netball and I was out during that time and a lot of the sport wasn't out, which I'll come on to a little bit later. But it gave me a huge stepping stone being in that role. And interestingly, I was uh, my office was um, on Lansdowne Road 
at Bedford College at the early days. Um, but what it gave me was a great stepping stone to other things. So then when I became um, head of volunteering at Sport England, it gave me a much broader reach to influence policy. And I guess that's what I've always tried to do is, is find a way to influence policy to better people's lives through sport and then implement it and then find out from the implementation, what are the barriers? How do I need to change the policy again and then implement it? And one of the things around volunteering again was, was pulling the sports sector and the voluntary sector together because it was very, very separate. Um, and, and again, by being out and being open and being vulnerable, I, I managed to manoeuvre the sector together, which which created the best strategy we've ever had. Mm-hmm. So that was a really positive time. And and again, I guess it was that affirmation again that happened at Sport England. Um, during the Roger Draper years, they had awards for staff of the year and things. And I got awarded um, the, the the best employee of the year, which which it wasn't the award. It was that somebody took time to nominate me for the work that I'd done on the year of the volunteer and how inclusive I'd been across the whole sector. So what started to show me is sometimes you have to take a risk um, and I call it squeaky bum time. If you've got squeaky bum, you know, you're, you know, you're going to struggle, you know, it's a challenge, but actually it's really worth it because if you get through that, there will be people who can get through it too. So that was some of the things early on. And then when I started moving from the paid professional side into the, the director side of, of some of the roles I've had, I became, I applied for and became the senior independent director at Swim England, which some of you may know as the ASA, but swimming basically. Um, and the the chairman at the time was an Edward Lord who was bisexual and um, linked to to one of the Stonewall champions. Anyway, we were the, the chair and, and vice chair in English, um, and we developed the equality plan for swimming, which which again is a few years back. But what it was pretty clear to us, we wanted to make sure that swimmers, divers, synchronized swimmers. They all should feel comfortable in a pool in their environment, whether they're coaches, whether they're swimmers, whether they're technical referees. Um, so we put that plan in place. And, and lo and behold, it wasn't too too long later till Tom Daly came out. And I'm not saying it's because we had a plan in place, but to have two visible leaders in a sport that didn't have a huge amount of LGBTQI people in it. Again, it showed me that if you can lead the way and put the right policies in place, it hopefully helps people on their journey. And then I think latterly in my my career, um, I still got a long way to go, by the way, I'm still not that old, but um, I've been mentored and coached by a lot of people. You know, people think when you become a chief exec, you know it all. You definitely don't. I know my part of being a chief exec and it's taken a lot through those years and still now where people have mentored and coached me. And um, even at times like doing the speech, you know, you there are there are the insecurities that come through i'm not an lgbtq expert i just happen to be a lesbian um, from yorkshire who works in sport that that's me but i can give you experiences but i'm not an expert so i think being my authentic self because i was comfortable with being gay and i was proud to be gay or a lesbian meant that people accepted me for that and somehow because i was proud of myself people were proud of me and then asked me to do more and more this is just how it happens in the sector so I was asked if I'd apply for swimming, then I was asked if I'd be the Institute of Swimming Chair, then I was asked to do an international role. And I don't know why, but that seemed to keep happening. And I think it's because I was confident of who I was and what I could do. Um, And nobody in the background could be saying, oh, she's a lesbian, by the way, kind of stuff. It didn't matter, really. It was just Lisa doing the job, which is exactly how it should be. Um, And I think the other thing I've learned throughout all that, Julie, is it's just a small part of me. I'm a mum, I'm a cancer survivor, I am from Yorkshire and I've mentioned it far too many times, Um, but there's lots of elements to me and my sexuality is just one element, it's not the the whole element and I think that's what's really important being a leader is showing all the different elements of it. Yeah, just as I say, it's being authentic, just as I say, just just you. Um, I mean, what have been any of the sort of the challenges, the real issues that you faced with being openly gay, perhaps more... um, not at university, but once you've left, being more of an adult and getting into further down in your career? Yeah, I mentioned netball. So I was out when I went to to netball. I was about 23. And there was a lot of lesbians in in the administration of netball and quite a few players. But it was the unspoken lesbian, if you like. Um, And I felt really lonely because I was out and I knew everybody else lesbians because they were in relationships and etc. But they wouldn't come out, and I found it really challenging. And I actually found it really, really lonely. Um, 
and what I didn't understand at the time is, you know, I was in one generation, the slightly older generation. It was it was more difficult to come out. They're in the the latter part of their their lives. They may well have been married previously, but it was it was really lonely at England netball. And you know, I, I just focused on work and, and didn't really worry about it. But even in playing and coaching at Bedfordshire County, that environment was still the case. And I found that really hard. That you know, we're role models as as coaches. And I found it really hard that we weren't role modeling to the youngsters coming through who somebody might have feelings in a certain way. And I felt you should be open about it. So that was a tough time because I loved it. It's my sport and I loved it. Whereas in football, everybody seemed to be a lesbian and hockey ever seemed to be a lesbian. But netball, it, they were, but they weren't, if you know what I mean. So so that was one of the early challenges. But I don't think I've, when I've spoken about this, I've tried to think back around domestically in this country. Have I faced any direct homophobia? And I don't think I have. Um, I'm not aware that I have anyway. I have faced quite a bit of sexism in terms of different roles that I've had. Um, there's an instance where um, I just had one of my daughters, Mackenzie, and one of her board members at the time made a comment about the sports minister shouldn't be allowed to have a baby while she was um, in office. Mm. And I asked that person to retract that comment and, and they didn't. So that created a few issues for, for me because I just thought it was an inappropriate comment. It wasn't homophobic, it, it was sexist. So. I'm not so sure that that I have, as I say, had many homophobic issues, but I, I also think that's probably because I'm Lisa. I'm not lesbian Lisa. I'm Lisa first and foremost that comes from Yorkshire, that happens to have children, that has got a wife that might be a lesbian, but it's not here I am, I'm, I'm a lesbian. It's not the first thing that comes, it might come across from how I look in terms of stereotypes, but that that's what I've I found as, as I say, I've gone through my career. Um, but I've also, I think one of the things, things I've realized is how lucky I've been in my career and um, I didn't really talk about it I was just out I was busy getting on and then I started to look back and think you know some kids are still committing suicide because of their sexuality and people are getting beat up on buses because of their sexuality people are being hung because of but Wayne right it's you're really comfortable where you are it's time that you spoke up about it in the sector so Stonewall got in touch uh, about six years ago now and said would I speak on the Rainbow Laces Summit which is the first summit they'd had around um, sport and, and pride if you like so I, I spoke six years ago first time on a platform which was um, interesting in itself just because I'd never done it before and then I decided I need to keep talking because I'm lucky that people came before me um, and it, it's my time now to make sure that if I can just help one person come out or be supported or, or feel like they're okay then that's that's worth the time and effort to put that in mm. and i think some of the stats still you know in terms of hate crime in britain you know one in one in five lgbt people experienced hate crimes in the last year and from a trans perspective just because of their gender identity two in five experience hate crime and scarily out of all those figures the scariest one for me is four out of five go unreported particularly from young people Mm -hmm. uh, so again, we are we are very fortunate this in country in relation to a number of our laws, but there are still some significant issues. Yeah, I, I mean, with that, is there a significant difference working internationally that you've noticed within the sporting arena? Yeah, hu huge differences, um, and I think I think it also depends on on the sport. So fairly early on, when I was chief exec at, at England Netball. Um, you get to go to World Congress every every two years and um, and European conferences every year. And I remember going to a European conference and you, you do all the formal proceedings and, and then you, you have drinks, as I'm sure you would imagine. And we were having drinks with all the, they call secretary generals, all the chief execs of all the 54 different countries. Um, and during the discussion, one of the guys, the secretary general from one of the Nordic countries, just was chatting away and I was talking about the kids and things and he, he just said well oh what does your husband do and I, and I just thought oh here we go so I said oh my husband doesn't my partner does at that point we weren't married so I used the word partner and um, and the more we got into the conversation I thought why am I why am I doing this so I then said you know it came out that that I'd got a female partner and he stopped talking to me and he, he couldn't cope with he just couldn't get his head around the fact that one I was a lesbian but two that I had children um and he avoided me for the next two days. And I, I found that really hard because I wanted to go and chase him and say, look, I, I know this is alien to you, but I'm a, I am normal. I promise you, I just 
happened to like girls instead of boys. But he, he didn't speak to me again. And I, I found that really quite hard. Um, yeah. And again, he may have had experiences himself. I don't know his background, but it was it was a really sharp. When you're in an international environment, do you, are you honest and authentic or not? And what I said to you is, is I can't be me without being authentic. So so I always am. So that was one of the the negative experiences I had. But um, another experience that that just I hope sings a lot about me. Never mind about the, the people I'm going to talk about. But I. Um, when I left Volleyball England, the international president, uh, Dr. Adi Grasser of Volleyball, invited me over to Switzerland to the head office. Um, and I wanted to say thank you because he'd been so supportive in my eight years as CEO. And I, I flew over to say thank you. And he said to me, so this guy is 70, 80 years old, a lawyer from Brazil. And he said to me, uh, Lisa, you come in my office, so I give you a job. And I was like, I'm sorry? He said, no, no, you come work for me. You come work for me. Give, I give you a job. And I was like, oh, my word. And my, my dad had just died and my mum had moved to live next door. I got two girls who were under the ages of three. I thought, I can't, I can't relocate to Switzerland. I'd love to, but I can't. And he offered me all these jobs. You can do this job, you can do this job. And I just said, you know, I, I can't. My, my partner's high up in the police. Your partner, he can come He can come and be security at, head, at headquarters in, in Switzerland, in Lausanne. And I'm like, shit, shit, what do I say? Apologies for the language. But I was like, I literally was feeling, what do I say? Do I tell him it's a woman? Do I not? What do I do? And I judged him. I judged him because he was an older guy that if I said she was a woman, it would affect the conversation and relationship. So anyway, I didn't accept a job. I was very polite, very honoured and, and left. And I got in the taxi and I was kicking myself for not saying, you know, it's not my husband, it's my wife. Anyway. I couldn't help myself. I emailed him from the taxi on the way to the airport and emailed Ari. Dear Ari, I am honoured that you've offered me the job. And he'd said about him being in the police, did I want to marry him for his uniform? So I took a, I had a picture of my wife in uniform and I sent it. I said, I absolutely went for the uniform, as you'll see with my partner. And this is no lie. This is an international president. This is a big role in a, a major global sport. Within one minute, he wrote back to say, the offer still stands, Lisa, come work for me. And it just... It just hit me so hard that I judged him. I was being homophobic with him. I was judging him. Yeah, yeah he was absolutely fine. He probably knew years ago when he'd been working with me. But it, it was one of those moments where I was scared. I was scared of the reaction and I shouldn't have been. So I think, as I say, some of the experience I've had in, in Europe with the Nordic guy was, was quite difficult. But with Ari, and I didn't take a job. But you know what? Two years later, he phoned me and he asked if I'd be a technical director at volleyball and and I accepted and, and I did it because I really respected how he treated me. I really did. I have no technical knowledge in volleyball, but I accepted the role. And it's a huge privilege to be part of it. So there, there's some of the experiences. And the last one internationally, I'm just conscious of time, but the last one internationally was around, I was asked by UK Sport, which is the, the elite body uh, for sport in this country, if I'd go out to um, Namibia to do some work on uh, women's empowerment. And when we was out there, I was asked, if because of my sexuality, I'd be uh, interested in in supporting one of the gay groups. Now, <laughs> many of you will know there's 68 countries that if that it's illegal to be gay, one of which is Namibia. And I'm like, so you're asking me to go on government business to a country that if I was found out, I could be hung, drawn and quartered. And I said, yes. And I went, OK, I'll do it then. And I just remember thinking, what am I doing? But anyway, I took lots of rainbow goodies. Stonewall gave me lots of goodies. I had them in bag. And I, I met these two guys in a so-called gay friendly club. And they're running a, a cycling club out there. And it just reminded me how lucky we are. They were petrified. They wouldn't accept the gifts in case they were found to have rainbow gifts on them. And it would therefore determine that they may be gay, which was my naivety. Absolutely. Um they were talking to me about one of the girls who looked in one of the tribes looked gay and they dragged her out of her, uh, the shack, the tin shacks that they, they live in. Um, and she was raped by all the elders for being for looking gay. And it, again, it, it just reminded me how dangerous it can be for some people and how lucky we are. Um, and, and what I was proud of is in doing that, it gave them support. Um, and, and they then came over over here for a little while, but, there's some of the experiences, some really shocking experiences, some not so, and some really positive experiences in international sport. And I guess the one thing I've learned is 
you should treat an individual as an individual, no matter how old they are, where they come from, what their background is, they're an individual and respect yeah. them for that. All right. Also, as you said, from your prior negative experiences, perhaps was what made you cautious on that second example. But uh, it's just supposed to be confident just to, to be yourself, regardless of, of that prior experiences. I mean, are you, do you think there's been much change over history? I mean, when you cite some of those things internationally, you'd probably say not in, some, in many of those countries. But here in the UK, yes. Yeah, I mean, here in the UK, there's been, I mean, a huge amount of change. Um, one of the reasons I didn't go into teaching was because of something called Section 28 under Thatcher's government. So as a teacher, I would not have been able to be honest about my sexuality because it would deem to be promoting my sexuality to children. Because clearly, if you talk about it, then you've got to be it. Crazily, if it was that easy to change your sexuality. Um so Section 28 back in the Thatcher years was horrific, absolutely horrific for a number of teachers and students coming through and pupils coming through school. Um, and I was delighted when when Cameron and others came in and, and changed that policy, particularly in terms of education. Um, obviously, we, we can now get married and I got married a few years back um, to Karina. So, so, so the laws are changing. There's a huge amount of protections in there. Obviously, there's, there's still a long way to go, particularly around trans and transgender uh, people and a lot of, of negative media around that at the minute but yeah I think I think we are we are lucky um, but there are still as I said earlier a significant number of incidents of hate crime that seem to be increasing um, mm. so the more we do to raise awareness um, the more important it is to me but as I say I think we're quite lucky here overseas I mean I, I've been to Namibia I work in Zambia um, as a volunteer with the Wallace group as you mentioned um, and I'm aware of obviously the laws over there. So you've just got to be extra cautious um, and be respectful of the cultures in, in, in some sort of ways. Um, yeah. But in terms of my view across the whole globe, I, I've not got that experience and, and, and worked at that level. Mm. I'm conscious that we've got quite a lot of comments, uh, so questions, um, and that perhaps it would be a good point for us to to move into sort of a and a But I just wanted to thank you for such an insight and thought-provoking sort of chat up to this point um, and perhaps we'll just move into some of the questions yep sure um so let me just see on the, the whole range of questions so we've got one so one uh, an early question that came in is is there's a huge difference in LGBTQ plus support and visibility between women's sport and men's sport. So why do you think that is? I'm, I'm honestly not so sure. I, I think the great news about Jake Daniels coming out recently over at Blackball Football Club and, and the amount of support he has received, uh, a huge risk for him, but a, but a huge amount of support. I, I generally don't know. I, I, I would anticipate it's something around the masculinity of the majority of male sports um, as opposed to, to the femininity supposedly of, of individual sports and team sports. So I think that might be might be something about it. I think something about the culture around sports, uh, the bravado that goes alongside it, that the macho part of it as well. Um, so I think that that might be some of the, the key things. Um, but it's it's interesting, isn't it? it? It takes one or two key people in certain sports to come out on others' will. So tennis, for example, Billie Jean King and, and Martina, many of people listening will, will have heard of them. It's not a particularly huge issue in tennis because they've, they've come out a lot earlier in that sport. But as I say, in, in football, as we know, it's, it's taken quite a long time for the first footballer, other than just in fashion, who, as we know, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, did come out. So I, I think it's the culture within each of the sports that... that creates some of the cultural challenges of people coming forward yeah i mean that links in with this question which is around i mean clearly you've had a very uh, inspiration for yourself but who do you look to for your inspiration um yeah i mean there, there's lots of people um that, that i look to but you know what some of them are, are local volunteers i know that sounds really silly but people in a local community driving the different local sports clubs who happen to be gay. I think for me, they're, they're the real diamonds that, that, that I look to and think, crikey, you're doing all that as well as your day job and as well as your family and as well as everything else. So some of those are, are real role models. But I think the one that probably 
I looked up to most was Harvey Milk. So Harvey Milk was um, a politician over in San Francisco who who was assassinated, was killed for being gay. But I think when I when I went to Warwick and there was a bar called Harvey's, I, I didn't know why it was called Harvey's, and then I found out it was in recognition of Harvey Milk. And I just thought, you know, he knew damn well when he was standing up in front of people, at some point somebody would get to him in terms of the homophobia in, in America at the time. And I thought, if, if he can do that, then, you know, again, part of giving me confidence, I'm not convinced somebody's going to shoot me for being a lesbian. They, they might do for other reasons. But um, for me, people like Harvey Milk and Martina, as I say, and Billie Jean, what, they, what they've led are the people that I would look up to. Yeah. I mean, here at the, the university and other universities, you know, the question there that universities do need that LGBTQ plus role models at, and at all levels. So what can sport and university do to encourage people to stand up and be seen, you know, to be their true self that we talked about earlier? Yeah, I, I think this is a is a great example that you're putting on um, this, particularly in, in Pride Month. I would hope that from a budgetary point of view, you are supporting your students um, through, if you've got a gay society, which I know you do, an LGBTQ society, to go down to Pride, to get sports teams to go down to Pride, to see that they're part of a much bigger picture than, than, than just to say it's all consuming. Um, I think I would have a, a network of support available for, for staff and students who, who may be considering coming out, link with the local charity, that might be important. And having links to organisations like Mermaids, because some of your staff may have children that are thinking they're, they're non-binary or wishing to transition. So for me, it's having a network of support, a culture that is, that is open and accepting of all, and put some funding in to support people that might want to, you know, they might want to do a seminar like this themselves. They may want to go to Prides. They may want to do some research in the amount of LGBTQI people out at, at the university. Um, which is when I started at, at, at Bedford University many, many years ago as part of my first piece of research I did. So that's what I'd, I'd hope you'd do. But I think even just your opening sentence was really important, uh, concluding sentence prior to me coming on when you said, you know, ladies and gentlemen and our non-binary colleagues and friends, that just says straight away, I'm not assuming that you are all ladies or gentlemen. I, I think it's really important that the staff use the right language. Yeah. And do the the question around what what do you see is the importance of allies there is it sort of all part of that support absolutely i i think you know from an equality point of view um anybody who can be an ally whether that be around sexuality whether it's about demographics or whatever it might be about for me you should treat people fairly and if you have a a role within a university you should treat every single student as fairly as the next one and as equally as the next one. So allyship is incredibly important, but active allyship. So if, if you if you notice that incident that's happening and you might infer that there's something not quite right, you don't walk away from it. You, you intervene and make sure somebody's, somebody's okay. You challenge the homophobic language, um, which is quite interesting. My, my daughters are now nine and 10 and they use the word gay ad libibly around because that's what people do at school and I'm kind of like, do you understand what that means like of course we do mum you're gay it's like no the way that you are using it so I think it's making sure as I say that that as an ally you're an active ally um, and that's not just wearing a rainbow badge for a month within a year it's consistently being that active ally challenging when somebody says lady and gentleman do you say what about our non-binary colleagues um, challenging the stereotypes that when people mimic stereotypes do you think that's really appropriate so absolutely completely agree with active allyship yeah and another qu question here is about how how do you feel about what trans athletes are experiencing in sport in the sports sector particularly yeah. in sport? it's a it's a hugely live debate um and i think emily bridges i watched the interview last night on itv She's I can't believe what she's had to go through in terms of her experience. It is it is difficult. There's a challenge between the equality and the, the fairness. This, this is a real life challenge at elite level. Um, but I think for me, what we have to remember as administrators in sport is these are human beings. They have feelings and they should be treated with respect. Um, and that's what I feel is not happening because there's a stronger debate coming through, which is transphobic rather than looking at 
will this really impact on on the actual activity from a grassroots perspective from taking part locally highly likely that that somebody transitioning and going from one gender to another in sport at a grassroots level there's not going to be an issue there may be at international sport but it's not clean cut so in some sports for example in, in volleyball and basketball the height differentials in, in males to female is one of the most significant things Whereas, as you'll imagine, in endurance sports, the, the strength attributes may well be, be more significant, although there's still d doubt around testosterone. So for me, the most important thing as we learn through this, and, and again, I think we should support trans people coming through sport at elite level. That doesn't mean to say they all compete straight away as a woman. What I'm saying is we should respect that these individuals are, are taking really tough decisions and being incredibly brave and they need our support. An understanding because it will be a significant amount of time until there's enough research to demonstrate what the right or wrong way will be um, and what I wouldn't want is anybody not taking part in sport because of that you know because sport is, is as I said at the beginning it's phenomenal it, it brings communities together and should bring communities together it keeps you healthy it keeps you fit um, everybody should be welcome in sport trans or not trans yeah I mean that links to the next question around the Blackpool, Blackpool footballer Jake Daniels recently came out as gay, you know, very difficult um, environment. So what advice would you offer him and his club in looking to support him? I, I think, I mean, I congratulate him. The way that he, he came out, the way it, it was managed, um, the way the club have all supported him, um, I think is a great example of how to do this well, really, really well. I think... And I hope that the challenge from going forward will be he's a footballer, first and foremost. He happens to be the first out gay, as I say, other than Justin Fashionu. Um, I think the challenge will be keeping maintaining focus on football because there will be a lot of noise around him, just like any athlete, um, whenever they either have a baby or, or come out or whatever it might be. So I think that would be the challenge. But I think he's got a, a great team around him. And I just want him to know, you know what? Well done, mate. Let's hope there's a lot more people that, that follow you onto the, into the football pitch because, you know, the amount of people that play that fabulous sport, that there's going to be a lot more people who are gay. Mm. And what about any advice for students, you know, particularly those who identify uh, LGBT plus, um, you know, might be looking to work in the sports industry. So any advice for them? Oh, go for it. It's the best industry in the world. Believe you me, you work with people. Some of us are bonkers, but it's it's I found it, as I say, a really, a really welcoming environment and sector. And that's whether I've been a director or a local trustee, worked internationally, as I said, or, or domestically. It's just it's just great. It's a great sector to work in. And if you yourself, you just get so much more out of it. So if you if you are thinking of coming to the sector, give me a buzz because I'm more than happy to help. Brilliant. Uh, and what is the best piece of career advice sort of linking in with that? I would say for, for those just uh, generally and then maybe in leadership as well, because you've got such experience there in leadership and in sport. Yeah, I think I, th I think I said to you about the squeaky bum moment. Um, if you get a squeaky bum moment, go with it. It's really important to challenge yourself. And if you think you can't, know that you can. So there's all these doubts, there's all the, the you know, the, the, the chimp paradox, the monkeys on your shoulders saying you can't do it, you can't do it. Just slap it out the way and say, yes, I bloody well can. And even if you don't get the job that you wanted, and, and I failed lots of times to get jobs, but I've got better jobs because there will be a role for you with the values that you have that match your values that you'll absolutely adore. So my career advice is you'll get loads of knockbacks, but just get straight back up, learn from it. Um, and know that there will be a role out there for you. So that, that would be my my career advice. And enjoy it. I always said, you know, if if out of the working week of seven days, because in our sector you work seven days a week because it's not work, it's it's life. Um, if three of those days you're, you're feeling a bit grumpy about it, change jobs. Don't continue in a job that you don't like. And I say that to your staff. Life's too short. You know, I got diagnosed with cancer in 2019. I could have not been here. Luckily, I, I got through that. Um, but life's too short to spend majority of your time in a job you don't like. You know, there are so many opportunities out there. So my career advice is take every opportunity with open arms. And if you're not happy, take control of it and change it. Great advice to all. Um, I mean, what have been your proudest moments in your career so far? And I say so far because I know you said you've got a lot more to do. 
Yeah, I, I think my proudest moment. So um, I talked about Section 20A and it broke my heart that I couldn't really be a teacher because I couldn't be authentic me. And I, I love developing people. So my proudest moment was I got invited to number 10 Downing Street with David Cameron in 2011 because the Conservative government following Thatcher had decided to develop a charter against homophobia. So I was, I think I was about eight months pregnant and um, I get to go to Downing Street to meet him, to have the photograph taken, to have the charter signed. And I just never really believed that that would happen to a Yorkshire lass standing at, in that environment, being a lesbian with a prime minister. I just thought, what, what is going on here? But the most important thing is when I got home, I stuck the charter on the door of our office. You know, the door plates that you have when you push a door open. I stuck the charter there. So all of our staff had to push the charter to get in and out of the office. It was subliminally saying, you are going to read this. You are going to be OK. We are going to be inclusive. But I think that was probably my proudest moment um, in terms of political side. And then more latterly, I was I was elected as um, to the British Olympic Association, um, the, the NOC members. So all the sports are members of the NOC, the Olympic sports. Um, and they elected me to be a director of the BOA. And, and that, again, I, as a Yorkshire lass, the first to go to university from our family, to think that I was a director of the British Olympic Association. I never even wanted to be a director of the Olympic Association, but some, suddenly somebody said, well, why don't you go for it? And I went, mm, OK, then. A bit like I just said, why not? And then when I got elected there, it, it just it just meant so much. And then I got petrified because I was sitting around a table with um, Sir Hugh Robertson, Princess Anne, etc., Sir, Sir, Baroness, Sir, Sir. And I thought, oh, my word. But um, that was a that was a proud moment. And I think the last one, and this is just some of the little things I get often asked to speak and I get asked to do a couple of panels on leadership or vulnerability or sexuality. And and a legal firm asked me to do it and they wanted a professional photograph of me. And so I sent a photograph of me, my wife and the kids swimming. And they said, no, 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 we need a professional shot with you in a suit. And I said, no, 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 you don't. You need a professional photograph of me. And that is. So you use that or you don't. I won't speak. And they used it and I got to speak. And the reason I did it is because you bring your whole self to, to life, to, to work. And I wasn't going to allow them to edit out a wife and kids to, to put me up as a leader. And that's what I am. No, this is the totality of me. And I think to stand up to a legal company, say, I'm not doing it unless you use the right photo. <laughs> it's quite a big thing. But since then, I've always used those images rather than the, the stock uh, standard photo shoot that we get so bored of seeing, quite frankly. Yes. I mean, someone's it's a pertinent question there. If you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would that be? Slow down a bit. <laughs> I I just can't say no. So um, I think earlier on in my career, if I did just stepped back and slowed down, I might have enjoyed it even more because I look back now to some of the places I've been lucky enough to go. I went to China and spoke at Basketball's World Congress. I've done Africa, as I said, and... I just didn't have time to really reflect and I didn't realise how fortunate I'd been. So I think it would be just just slow down a little bit. But I think I'm just driven to to change and, and driven to drive things forward. So it's it's really hard to say no if an opportunity to drive things forward comes comes forward. So maybe slow down. Yeah, so slowing down, enjoy the journey. Don't forget yep. to enjoy the journey along the way, as they say. Absolutely. Okay. That's a great piece of advice for us all. So on to the uh, last few questions. Um, there's one around um, the importance of LGBTQ plus friendly spaces of, at universities, for example, societies and networks. What would be advice for that? Oh, without a doubt, incredibly important. Uh, as I said, I, if I couldn't have gone to, to Zippy's Lounge for the first gay sock, in, in a very closed environment away from from all the rest of the university side i don't think i would have had the confidence to do so and i think it's, it's really important to think where those spaces are where the, the the entrance and exits are for people to go to them and having availability at all times 24 7 if you can um because i say it's incredibly important because if you are coming out or if you are out and having some some difficulties you need that space and people around you to support you. So yes, they're incredibly important. Mm, yeah. 
and then one of the last questions I think we've got is around what what can sport learn from the positive example in diversity of say the the women's football setup. I think as a, I think football is doing a phenomenal job, um, and and uh, England and British hockey actually, and I think the more we can do in terms of role modelling, the more we can promote both women in sport at every level, whether that be a participant, an athlete, or whether it be a coach um, in in terms of women's football, or whether it's technical officials or CEOs, that there's a huge amount that we can do um, across all all sports, and and part of what my day job is is to bring that good practice across all those 300 organizations um so there's a, there's a huge amount to learn uh, and whether that be around you know some of the really really key male footballers promoting women's football there was there's some research announced today from the women's sport trust that that shows where there are male allies promoting women's sport women's game fandom and spectatorship are increasing and increasing and increasing um and it doesn't take a huge amount to do that um, so for me, uh, absolutely, we can learn from women's football. Um, but there are many sports that do things incredibly well, much smaller sports as well that we can learn from. Yeah, great. Well, I think that's um, we've sort of uh, gone through lots of really pertinent and relevant questions, you know, to, to add to what's been a fantastic insight uh, to your journey in your life so far. And all those massive experiences, and as you said, it really is important, um, you know, to to be you know, the authentic, just being yourself. And I suppose it's feeling the fear, isn't it? As they say, and going with it, anyways. Um, so just to thank thank you again, Lisa, for the fantastic insights, you know, which have certainly given us all something to think about and to take away um, with us and reflect upon. Um, the, and thank you very much for, for your time, for, for joining us at the university. We just know how busy you are and to make time for us and all the sort of wider family life that you've got as well. So we really appreciate that. Um, so for, for all of those listening, I just to say keep an eye on our web pages for further information about up and coming events. It's great to have this event in, in the Pride Month, but there is one I'd like to promote that's coming up on the 20th of June at one o'clock till two. So that'll be in the um, details of the, the slides in terms of how you can link in with that. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful audience for supporting this very special event and for your ongoing support to the University of Bedfordshire. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank you.